I now have the distinct honor of introducing your commencement speaker for this evening, Mr. Mick Betancourt. Mr. Betancourt proudly walked the hallways of Fenwick High School from 1988 to 1992. Since then, he has gone on to build a successful career as a television and film writer and producer. He has a long list of accomplishments, beginning with his current role as writer and co-executive producer on The Purge for the Sci-Fi USA Networks. Most recently, he was a co-executive producer on Shots Fired, which premiered in March 2017 on Fox, starring Sanaa Lathan and Stephen James alongside Academy winners Helen Hunt and Richard Dreyfuss. Prior to this, Mick was co-executive producer on Wicked City, Ironside, Necessary Roughness, Mob Doctor, and Breakout King. Additionally, he worked on Chicago Favorites, Chicago Fire, and Chicago PD, and spent three seasons co-producing Law & Order SVU. When Mick is not writing or producing films, he has been known to perform stand-up comedy on NBC, HBO, TBS, Comedy Central, and the Chicago and Montreal Comedy Festivals. In his free time, if there is such a thing, he, uh, Mick loves spending time with his wife and his two beautiful children in their L.A. home. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. Mick Bedenport. What's up, everybody? How are you? I think it's selfie time. There we go. If cell phones had been around when your parents and I were kids, half this room would have a prison record. <laughs> First off, I want to congratulate Ms. Uh, Drago, Mr. Alasco, and Mr. Polka on their retirement uh, before I begin. And also, thank you, Garrett, for your wonderful speech, and congratulations for your scholarship. But let's also give the Mulcahy family a round of applause for not having to pay that tuition. <laughs> Congrats, Mulcahy. And I'd like to start a tradition here as a commencement speaker, which is just ridiculous as you're about to find out why. Um, I would like to honor, as a fellow Fenwick Friar myself, the men and women who have so selflessly sacrificed hours that we will, you will only understand when you get a little older, the faculty and staff here. Thank you so much. Let us all give a round of applause, too, for your parents, the aunts, the uncles, the single mothers and fathers working double duty to get you here to this day today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> I'd also like to say before I begin that my top button was unbuttoned and Mrs. McGall gave me junk. <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> Father Pettycourt, Mr. Groom, Ms. Kelleher, honored guests, parents, relatives, faculty, and staff. We are here to celebrate a very special occasion, the Fenwick High School graduating class of 2017. Congratulations. And we are also here to celebrate another special occasion, certainly not as important, but important nonetheless. This is the first time in history that a commencement speech has been given by somebody from Berwyn. <laughs> Where are the Berwyn kids at? Make some noise. Make some noise! That's right. I'm here today to pass the baton to you so that you too can return in 25 years and share your wisdom. Berwin. <laughs> Lesson number one, never take yourself too seriously. I have worked all over the world with politicians, billionaires, Emmy and Academy Award winners, but consider this, 
one of the highest honors in my life for one simple reason. Fenwick High School saved my life. When I was 12, I lived for almost two years on my own without parents. It was June of 1987. I had just finished seventh grade and was living with my grandfather on 25th and Clarence in Burlington. <laughs> One morning, I walked into his room to wake him up, and he had a massive heart attack and died in my arms. To this day, it is the most tragic thing that has ever happened to me. After his funeral, I stayed in his apartment and nobody came to get me. My mother lived downstairs, but her alcoholism got the best of her, and I knew very quickly that I was now on my own. When the food ran out, I begged on street corners for money or stole food to eat. But through that dark time, there was a glimmer of light. What if I could get into Fenwick? My grandmother had worked in the business office at Fenwick and I visited the school in fifth grade. There was magic in the halls. I could feel it. Fenwick felt like possibility, opportunity, and most importantly, hope. In eighth grade, I took the entrance exam. My grandmother reached out to her contacts at the school and told me, you got in, but you're the dumbest of all your friends. <laughs> That's what you call an Irish compliment. <laughs> I forged my mother's signature on the paperwork and financial aid and started. Here was my schedule freshman year. Waits for wrestling at 6 a.m. Work before and after for my financial aid at the school, wrestling practice until 5, then work at Giovanni's Pizza on Roosevelt as a busboy from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m., head home, sleep for three and a half hours, then back to Fenwick to do it all over again. Then, one day, I crashed. I asked to speak to my freshman counselor, and I told him my secret, that I didn't have any parents and had it for almost two years. Fenwick jumped into action and reached out to my aunt and uncle who took me in for the remainder of high school. Even though I had gone through serious hardship, Fenwick never lowered its standards to accommodate me. I had to raise mine to accommodate Fenwick. Adversity does not define you. How you react to it does. And before I knew it, I was a senior. I thought I knew everything, but I was so dumb. <laughs> Dum, 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 dum. When I was 18, I almost joined the Marines twice to get a sword. <laughs> Four years of my life for a sword? That sounds like a good deal. Then Mr. Bohr stepped in and in no certain terms or words told me that I would be the worst Marine in the history of the Corps. <laughs> and he pulled his Mr. Bohr's magic and somehow got me a scholarship to college. But guess what? I drank that scholarship away. Loyola University kicked me out after only one year. I thought the Jesuits were supposed to be forgiving but it turns out a .02 GPA is the threshold for their forgiveness. <laughs> I threw away a scholarship. I was a failure. 19 and my life was over before it even began. Again, adversity does not define you. How you react to it does. Over the next five years, I bounced from one job to the next. While my friends were graduating from college, I was working as a short order cook and driving trucks. But a voice inside me kept saying, you love making people laugh. You love writing. Why don't you do something with that? But I had no idea how. I was submerged in fear. Fear is the great thief. It will take everything you give it. But what if? If you remember anything from my speech today, I want you to remember these two words, what if. I thought to myself, what if I give it a shot? I saw an ad in the Chicago Reader for a comedy open mic. I was terrified, but I went. I signed up and I sucked. <laughs> I got one laugh, one more than I thought I was gonna get. But I walked through the fear, showed up and I tried. Walk through your fear, show up and try. Whatever you're doing is what you'll get better at. 
Go to the bar every night and drink. Guess what you're going to get better at? Walk through your fears. Show up for life, a life you're not even sure you deserve or is possible. And guess what happens? That life starts to appear. One day I was driving trucks for Home Depot and Niles. Hate to brag. <laughs> Delivering drywall to an empty lot in Glenview. Nothing but a half acre of dirt and in the middle a small tent. I met the contractor, a Polish immigrant named George. I asked him what the tent was for. He said he and his brother had taken their life savings, bought a one-way ticket from Poland to Chicago to buy an empty lot, build a house on it, and split the money. So you guys are living in that tent? I asked. Yeah. Where do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> He opens the tent and points to a small metal Folgers coffee can. Yeah. Two years later, I'm delivering a patio door to a mansion in Longview. A lady opens the door and asks, are you Mick? Yeah, why? Somebody upstairs wants to see you. I walked upstairs and there was George with a huge grin on his face. I started jumping up and down. Is this your house? I asked. You bet your ass it is. <laughs> Come here, I want to show you something. George brought me into a gigantic bathroom with marble tile in between the bidet and the toilet. There was the Folgers kid. I started crying, but George did because it's a medical fact that Polish contractors can't cry. George helped me have an epiphany. Three of my grandparents were immigrants and moved to America to go after their dreams. I believe this is the greatest country in the world, and I learned the hard way that my American dream was hidden in my work boots. Inspired by George living in that tent and my immigrant grandparents, I turned to my wife and I said, we're moving to L.A. But we don't know anybody in L.A., my wife said. It doesn't matter. I'm going to find the hardest working person out there and work twice as hard. And what if it all works? What if it all works out? And there it is again. What if? What if I moved to LA? What if I worked really hard? What if I actually made a living in the entertainment business? What if? Before my wife moved out to LA, I lived in a rental car for six months. When my son was born, I was working at Starbucks making $400 a week. It was looking grim, so I doubled down. For every hour I worked a day job, I matched that working towards my dream. If I worked eight hours at Starbucks, I went home and I rode for eight hours. I've done three things perfectly in my 43 years on this planet. I've tried, I have failed, and I have tried again. Do not ever, ever, ever give up on yourself. No matter how dark it gets, you keep going, no matter what. I was 30 years old before I got my first break. 12 years after I graduated from Fenwick, and thank God I've been working ever since. I'm a storyteller. I make things up for a living. But the greatest story I've ever created is my own. You are all storytellers, every one of you. You tell stories about how your day was, stories about your past, and now it's time to write the story of your future. You are the writer of your own story, your own destiny. And I hope the story you write satisfies the deepest level of your soul. And that being said, I'd like to end this speech with a story of my own. One night, when I was in eighth grade, I was walking with my best friend Mike in Berwyn. <laughs> it was Christmas time, and we were walking down the middle of the street looking out into the houses. Christmas trees drizzled with tinsel and ornaments. Jealous at the seeming normality of everybody's life but ours. We were poor and scheming for ways to make money and eat that night. What if we sing Christmas carols? I pitched Mike. And we don't know how to sing, he said. And we're kids. They gotta give us something, a couple bucks. Mike was a first generation Slovak who scrunched his face when he was thinking and would look out at the horizon and just nod. <laughs> Finally, he said, okay, let's do it. So we knocked on the first door, and an old Italian woman answered in a big green house dress. What do you boys want? She asked. We're from St. Odillo Choir, ma'am. We'd like to sing you some Christmas carols. 
Okay, boy, sing a you song. <laughs> but Mike and I had not gotten that far in the play. <laughs> it looked like Mike was going to bolt, so I jumped in the silent night right away. And like a true friend, he stayed and sang. Silent night. We sang in the key of puberty. <laughs> down, and there is the mangiest alley cat and all those alley cats who had walked up the stairs and just sat next to us. We kept going. All is calm. All is bright. The woman yelled, Mario, come here, this voice has got a singing cat. <laughs> Good, Mario yelled out from the lazy boy. <laughs> the woman gave us 15 bucks, which is like 9 million to a 13 year old. Mike reached down, scooped up the cat, and ran to the gas station where I bought tons of junk food Coca Cola, Funyuns, Doritos, Zingers, and of course, strawberry quick for the cat. <laughs> The second the cat finished the milk, he raced off across the street. We chased it. It was gone. Defeated Mike and I walked home. I turned to him and I asked, what are we going to do? I'm going home, Blake said. I don't mean tonight, right now. I mean with our lives. We can't rely on singing cats for food for the rest of our lives. You mean when we get older, Mike said? Yeah. He says, I'm going to be a businessman. And I just about fell out. I started laughing so hard, I fell into a giant pile of snow. We don't even know a guy that owns a suit. How are you going to be a business guy? And he said, I don't know, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to Fenwick, then go to a good college and figure it out. There's that magical word again, Fenwick. What are you going to do, smartass? Mike said to me. I want to be a writer. Well, now it's Mike's turn. He fell out laughing. You think I'm crazy for being a businessman? How the hell are you going to be a writer? I don't know. I never even said it aloud. Well, I hope you do it, he said. Yeah. I hope you do it too, Mike. Well, Mike and I both went to Fenway and graduated class of 1992. Mike is married with three kids and is the vice president of an insurance company in California. And me, I just started writing and producing my 14th television show. Graduating class of 2017, you have been blessed with a once in a lifetime gift. You are Fenwick Friars. The friendships you've made here will last a lifetime and so will your education. Take your hustle, your heart, and your faith out into the world. Never give up on yourself, and magical things will happen. And most importantly, what if? And I'll let you finish the rest of that sentence, because now it's time for you to start writing the next chapter of your story. Thank you, and God bless you.